how are we doing today? We are good. Um, thank you for letting me come up here, fools. Um, so far in this, this sermon series, we've been looking at um, God encounters. And last month was the Old Testament. Um, I've got the privilege of ushering in the New Testament. So this month and today, we're going to be looking at Jesus encounters, Zacchaeus. So today we're going to be looking at Zacchaeus' physicality, his motivations, his character, and the supernatural transformation that comes from his encounter with Jesus. A woman walks into the pharmacist and asks, have you got anything for hiccups? The pharmacist ducks behind the counter and a moment later, jumps up, yells loudly. She falls backwards. What's going on? Why did you do that? Pharmacist says, you haven't got hiccups anymore. The woman says, I didn't have hiccups. It was my husband out in the car. <laughs> How many times in life do we jump to the wrong conclusion? How many times do we rush to the wrong judgment? Many times... We're just wrong about people and wrong about how things really are. Now, if you would like to switch on your Bibles, just push the power button. And let's head over to Luke 19, 1 to 10. And I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. Give me a few more seconds. If you don't have your Bibles with you, it is coming up on the overhead as well. But we are going to be jumping around and going back. Are we good to go? Give me a thumbs up. There's plenty of thumbs in the house. So let's start. 19 verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a good look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. Seven, but the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. Let's get a little bit of context here. Let's have a quick look at Jericho. Now, the last time I spoke, we spoke up of Jesus' first disciples, which is right up at the very, very top there, up the Sea of Galilee. And we're going to be coming down south, down the Jordan River to Jericho, which is right near the Dead Sea, just north of the Dead Sea. Now, Jericho, I'll move out of the way, guys. Can you? Jericho is located 258 meters below sea level in an oasis in the Jordan Valley. It's the lowest city in the world. So, when there's going to be flooding, it's going to be there first. Thankfully, there's mountains around, and so the flooding needs to get really, really high. The nearby spring um, produces 1,000 gallons of fresh water per minute. And that irrigates two and a half thousand acres, which is a big amount of land, um, through channels and then feeds into the Jordan River. 
Average temperatures, January is 11 degrees centigrade, and in the summer is 31. So it's not huge, not huge parity. Jericho's got a uh, hot desert climate, rich soil, and with the abundant spring water, made it a great place to settle. Not only that, it was an extremely wealthy city because it was the center of the lucrative uh, balsam production and export. Now, balsam was a, a resin from a plant or a tree that was used for medicinal purposes. Being a city of the Roman Empire, a tithe, money, needed to be paid to Rome um, in the form of taxes. And tax collectors were employed to collect these funds and then send them to Rome. Once Rome's tithe had been paid, what was left over was then kept as commission or embezzled by the tax collectors themselves. This led to the tax collectors being labelled uh, corrupt as they worked for Rome. Uh, they were also known as traitors to the people of Israel. Now let's look at Zacchaeus. In verse 2, we can see that Zacchaeus worked hard to get into a position of chief tax collector because he had become very rich. It doesn't say he was born into a wealthy family and maintained his fortunes. He had become rich. He was driven, driven to succeed. So much so that the people of Jericho saw him as notorious. Let's have a quick look at the word notorious. Uh, it basically means famous for something immoral or bad. Notorious. In verse 3, we see that Zacchaeus was a short man. In an empire where authority was seen in its soldiers, huge muscled men wearing uniforms, a sign of power, someone of diminutive stature uh, would have been looked down upon. Could this have been the source of Zacchaeus' drive to succeed? To become wealthy? To climb the ladder of power? Despite what anyone thinks of him. Did he have a chip on his shoulder? Chains of past wrongs fueling a desire and self-worth through notoriety. When Jesus asked to go to Zacchaeus' house, was Zacchaeus' great excitement and joy because Jesus was following him where others wanted Jesus to follow them? However, is Zacchaeus truly the villain that the crowd sees him as? Zacchaeus' name, translated from Hebrew, means innocent. Imagine living with a name meaning innocent while everyone around you reviles you, believes you are corrupt and looks down upon you. Now we can tell Zacchaeus had some unresolved issues. We can tell he had baggage. Um, it's weighing him down. But is he all bad? Zacchaeus had realised something was missing in his life. He may not have known what, but it is there. There's a whole, no amount of wealth, revenge or notoriety can resolve. How long had these misgivings been at Zacchaeus' heart, we don't know. But it'd become a, a tangible thing that Zacchaeus is battling with. Back to verse 3. We can see that Zacchaeus tried to get a good look at Jesus. Why? Why was he there? Why did he need to see Jesus? Now, if it was just mild curiosity, why, in verse 4, did he run ahead to climb a tree? Back then, running is seen as odd, without decorum. Someone in power does not run. Yet, someone who had been ridiculed for being small 
someone who'd gone through that, had, had worked hard to not get respect, but had worked hard to get wealth and power, why would he lift up his robe and run and risk that ridicule again? Something is happening with Zacchaeus. Why would you also act as a child, get, get up on a climb a tree, go out on a limb, just to catch a glimpse of the great teacher Jesus? Zacchaeus can sense something of the awe-inspiring, supernatural power within Jesus. This is validated, the supernatural power, by in verse 5, Jesus looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Jesus, the great teacher, the son of man, God made flesh, knows Zacchaeus' name. It's known Zacchaeus' name all along. Jesus says, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. The Greek word for must, which is dei, D-E-I, is often used in the Gospel of Luke to denote divine necessity. Jesus had to stay with Zacchaeus' home in order for his mission to seek and save the lost. So in verse 6, the great excitement and joy that Zacchaeus displays is not of one-upmanship. It's a realisation of hope. It's a realisation of salvation. It's a realisation of transformation. It's a realisation that in Jesus, Zacchaeus sees a version of himself that is greater than he can possibly imagine. Jesus is a guest in Zacchaeus' home, where he's fed, teaches, lays a blessing on the home. This then spurs Zacchaeus to repent his old ways. In verse 8, it says, Meanwhile... Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Going back to the Greek, the translation of the Greek word give, didomi, that's D-I-D-O-M-I, is used exactly the same, but in multiple tenses. Future tense, I will give. Past tense, I am giving, or I'm already giving. And present tense, I give. So when he says, I will give, the translation could be, I've already given half my wealth, or I'm going to give half my wealth. This verse reinforces the position that Zacchaeus had started to question his life choices, even before his Jesus encounter. When he said to Jesus, if I have cheated of those taxes, not those I have cheated of their taxes. Is Zacchaeus actually a legitimate tax collector who's not corrupt? This Jesus encounter starts a supernatural transformation. Sinner to forgiven, greed to generous, hated to loved, wounded to healed, lost, found. So in verse 9, Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. Jesus seeked, seeked if that is a word, searched, found, yeah, and saved Zacchaeus. 
Now, this is one of the amazing stories of the Bible that you could pluck straight out of 2,000 years ago, and it is as relevant to today as it is back then. My own supernatural transformation started with a God encounter, and I'm going to read a paragraph from what I wrote on my day of salvation. One morning, a man was walking to work, letting his mind go blank. He just put one foot in front of the other. Memories came unbidden to mind, some good and some not so. Highs and lows of his life bring in momentary flashes of happiness, sadness and embarrassment. Deeds of stupidity and recklessness passed before his mind's eye, and he gasped with dismay at how close he had come to never becoming the family man he so enjoyed. Between moments, a revelation of understanding gripped the lone walker and his eyes filled with tears. He was not alone in his walk along the beach of life. Behind him, in his footsteps, the Lord was there, helping, sustaining, and ensuring he did not fall. The realization of the blessings that had been heaped upon the man throughout the years took his breath away, and he immediately gave thanks, saying, Lord, you have been with me when I knew not of you. Please, Lord, no longer walk behind me while I walk my path, walk beside me and lead me to your glory. That is from my testimony in 2013. Now, the great thing about testimony, as that was spoken earlier on, it is your personal story. And as such, it cannot be argued with. It is personal, it is accurate, it is not third hand. That supernatural encounter, that was, for me, a checkered past, forgiven. The wrong road, put back on track. A life changed. A transformation begun. A journey undertaken. Life is not about the number of breaths you take. It's about the moments that take your breath away. I'm going to say that again. Worship group, could you come on up, please? Life is not about the breaths you take. It's about the moments that take your breath away. And no. Have you done something wrong in the past? Have you been down a path in your life that, looking back, you really shouldn't have? Are there things holding you back, like a weight on each ankle, stopping you from running your race? Is there a hole in your life that nothing seems to be able to fill? Do you find yourself going out on a limb, exactly like Zacchaeus, looking for meaning? There is a Jesus encounter available for everyone. A moment that starts a supernatural transformation. A moment that delivers peace and joy. A moment that shows you who you can be and the pathway to get there. A realization that you are loved, forgiven, and known by name. And have a quick look at the definition of love. An intense feeling of deep affection. The synonyms for this, the same words. Fondness, tenderness, warmth, intimacy, attachment, endearment, devotion, adoration, doting, 
idolization, worship, passion, ardor, desire, yearning, infatuation, adulation, besottedness, compassion, care, regard, solicitude, concern, friendliness, friendship, kindness, charity, goodwill, sympathy, kindliness, altruism, philanthropy, unselfishness, benevolence, grace. That's just God to you. No matter the mistakes we have made or are yet to make, no matter how broken we are, no matter how far we move away from him, he will always be the same. The loving father adoring his children. Jesus knows you by name. He always has. He's your personal friend and he's always reliable, always available. Romans 8.1 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He knows your past and the paths you have trodden. He loves you despite and because of your journey. He does not condemn. He forgives with a reckless abandon time and again. You can never be too far away from him and he will always be there, always available. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life has gone, the new has begun. You are loved with an infinite love that can never diminish. He is passionate about you, your loves, your fears, your desires, your motivations. His passion for you is everlasting and boundless. There's no aspect of your life that he is not completely passionate about you. Verse 10 says, For the Son of Man, meaning Jesus, came to seek and save those who are lost. With an infinite, all-knowing, all-powerful God, is there anywhere we can hide from him? Is there anywhere we can go that he cannot see us? Humanity does have free will and many have turned their backs on him. Yet he still seeks. And all anyone needs to do is turn around and they will see him already reaching out. Life is not about the number of breaths you take. It's about the moments that take your breath away. A moment could be here now please can everyone bow your heads and close your eyes now if there's something that's in your heart if you feel there's a hole if you feel there's something missing, if something that I've spoken about just touches a chord with you, if there's that feeling, you've had it for a while, the feeling you know something is there, something amazing, just waiting for you to step into it. If you have not taken Jesus into your life as your personal Lord and Saviour, we now have an opportunity to grasp a moment, to have your own personal Jesus encounter, to begin a supernatural transformation. If you've not given your life to the Lord and you wish him in your life to guide you, sustain you, give you peace and joy, just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. 
Can everyone please remain with your head bowed and eyes closed and repeat after me as we pray. Lord, we both know that. I have not always got it right. We both know that. I have done things wrong. Lord, I say to you now, sorry for all of those things. I know your sacrifice on the cross and rising three days later gives me the opportunity to be the person you want me to be. So help me, Lord. Become my personal Lord and Saviour. And I will follow you through the easy and the tough times. I ask this in your holy name. Amen. If this is the first time you have said this prayer, you are a new person. A supernatural transformation has begun and you will never, ever be alone. Now, if you have already given your life to the Lord Jesus, but feel like you are still in Zacchaeus' tree, wondering if you should respond to Jesus calling you down from the tree to take Jesus to your home, I will be asking you to come forward and the ministry team will pray for your situation. It could be a decision that you've put off. It could be something that you know you need to step into, but are fearful of the consequences of such a movement. It could be a desire to move ever closer to Jesus, but something, something keeps getting in the way. Whatever the issues are, a moment in a Jesus encounter will bring power and blessings to your life. If you feel you need prayer, please come forward. Come forward and take a moment.